Hello and welcome to episode 92, part 1 of Awesome Astronomy for February 2020. And this month, we're sending you all the love. Why? Valentine's Day! I hear you cry. F*** off. Why would we celebrate a modern holiday designed to do nothing more than rinse you of all your spare cash in the form of dying flora and overpriced confectionery? It's six weeks after Christmas, I still got three chocolate oranges knocking about in the cupboard. Why do I want some cheap foil drab hearts made out of what can only be described as an inferior approximation to the glorious decadence of a lint chocolate reindeer? Nah, we're all giddy and starry-eyed because we've got one whole extra day this month to get, well, all giddy and starry-eyed. This year is a leap year. And that means one more opportunity to stare at the heavens in awe of everything the universe has to offer us. Or, if you live in the UK, one more opportunity to stick your head out the window, realise it's cloudy and resign yourself to opening up the last bottle of Baileys that Nana left behind on Boxing Day. Either way, we're all seeing stars. I'm Jenny, your host for this month, and hovering about is my favourite little cherub, Ralph. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I originally had written and my stuffed teddy of a lackey, but maybe it should be on my blow-up doll, Paul, after that sound. <laughs> or inflatable sheep, actually. Oh, yes. Love that an inflatable... would be more appropriate. I love an inflatable <laughs> sheep. And my, have I loved an inflatable sheep. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a married man with children. Of course I do. And now a sheep. <laughs> and now a sheep. I've taken her as my mistress. <laughs> when I die, she inherits everything. Well, we know what Paul's been getting up to. Don't need to ask him. What about you, Ralph? What's occurring? Oh, well, uh, so last time we were on air, last time we downloaded, last time we came into your phone, um, <laughs> I, I was saying that uh, I was waiting on the Cradle of Aviation Museum to get back to us. Oh, God, did I go over there and have a whale of a time. Mm. Uh, so I was over oh, in New I York know. for a week and went over to Garden City in New York and had a tour by the curator, um, spoke to one of the Grumman test engineers that worked on the lunar modules, testing the lunar modules before they flew, and <sighs> turned um, a load of interviews that I got into a almost kind of like a documentary on the um, the history of flight from early flights to space missions, which, if you haven't already, you can now download um, the same way that you would download this show um, on a podcast extra called From the Cradle to the Stars. And we had a whale of a time, oh, and, and we might even be going back. You can tell you had we a whale might. of a time. Oh, man, I was beside myself. You were just geeking out in that. Absolutely. I know, it was just hitting up like the facebook chat all the time it was like look at this 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 oh it was great (laughs) well i mean big thanks go out to gavin price our good friend um, and listener who who suggested it in the first place he didn't even know that there was the um apollo 19 lunar module the one that didn't fly the only lunar module that isn't a mock-up um that was actually made for the apollo 19 flight or 18 flight, 19, I think, um, and and never flew, is actually in that museum. Gavin didn't even know that it was there when he suggested it. Yeah. And then went out there, boom, amazing. And test facility, lunar module that the guy that I'm interviewing actually worked on and played with and clambered around. And, oh, man, what, oh, what so a museum cool. that was. Yeah, that looked amazing. And loads and loads of Grumman stuff as well. You had the, um, you sent that picture of the A6 Intruder, the big... Yeah, carrier bomber. Yeah. It's like, oh, it's a sexy aeroplane. I like yeah, that. Yeah, th- I mean, there was a, there was an A six in there. There's a F fourteen Tomcat. Mm-hmm. There's um, an A ten. I forgot what it's called. The tank busting. Oh, the Warthog thing. Warthog. That's Thunderbolt right. Yeah. Thing. Yeah. Um, there's pretty much um, everything that was built by any of the companies that were on Long Island, and most of the big companies were there. Curtis was there. Uh, Republic um, Grumman before it became Northrop Grumman. Um, so there's a huge uh, history of everything from the hobbyists all the way through to the big defence contractors that were working on Long Island. And now you've got Northrop Grumman, Lockheed Martin, BAE Systems, pretty much everybody um, yeah. that's involved in aviation there. 
that have got some kind of presence on Long Island. So there's a huge, rich her- heritage that you just don't get anywhere else. Mm. And, you know, they're all providing exhibits, the museum, and, and Grumman, uh, 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 or Northrop Grumman as it is now, just providing so much to that museum, which is just wonderful that it's not going in the trash bin. Yeah. But um, also, um, I just want to give a shout out as well, because they were so gracious in inviting us over there and giving us so much of the time that on April the 23rd, the museum is doing a special event um, for the Apollo 13 50th anniversary. So this is where they're going to have the Apollo 13 astronauts Jim Lovell and Fred Hayes um, mm. and oh the Mission God. Control Flight Directors Milt Windler, Jerry Griffin and Gene Krantz and the NASA engineer John Aaron and maybe even Jen. <gasps> yes, <gasps> maybe even Jen. <gasps> yeah, because we after your... Uh, your very successful trip. They invited us back, but um, I'm the only one who's got time to go. So <laughs> yeah. uh, it might it might be me. So yeah. we're we're in discussion at the minute with them. Um, sort of organ, you know, trying to work things out. Um, so yeah, maybe it'll come to the episodes in March, and I'm going to be losing my tiny little brain, and I'm not going to be able to do anything sensible for about six weeks because I'm going to meet an Apollo astronaut, oh. maybe. <laughs> I, I am yeah. I am so envious. I can't go. I was all over. When 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 you said, like, oh, we've been invited, I was like, yeah, let's go. And then the date didn't work. And just, yeah, I, I mm. might be able to go, but I won't know until kind of last minute mm. just because it's, the, it's about a week, week and a half before Astro Camp. But um, uh, if you just go on to cradleofaviation.org um, and search around there, you'll find the um, the Apollo 13 event on the 23rd of April. And uh, you may even um, see us there, too. Mm. Mm. So not only can you meet an Apollo astronaut, but you can meet the stars of awesome astronomy. <laughs> I almost forgot that the, yeah. uh, the Apollo astronauts were going to be there amongst that talk yeah. of us being there. <laughs> <laughs> Well, we have had to completely change tax now. I'm not even going to try and segue. I'm just going to... Yeah, because how can you segue? You can't. I'm just going to change tax. You should have said, from, we... from one group of stars to another. Oh, beautiful. Oh, uh, yeah. Okay. Um, <laughs> from one group of stars to another. <laughs> Haven't we had some lovely weather? The day we went to Banger. Yeah, to Banger. Wow. <laughs> it's, it's do you know what it, it was a very short window but we had a really nice high pressure window over the UK for a, mm. for a few days and it was good I think it was like the highest pressure system recorded right it, for like the time of year or something pretty much wasn't it it's not the record overall in the UK I think that's that didn't quite but it almost did but it was the highest yeah. it was the highest in London ever in 300 something years and I think it was the highest in, in Wales but I think Scotland holds the record for the UK. I think it was still a little bit off the, the yeah. kind of absolute UK record for pressure. Um, but God, the, the sky was clear. Oh, man. And it coincided with Venus being high mm. and bright in the oh, evening as well. Wasn't and it? it I, was the, shocking. The first night I was out and took a look towards Venus, I did a double take. I thought, is this a low flying plane that's just dead yeah, on? Yeah, yeah. Every yes. time Venus is there. Oh, yeah. I forget just how bright it is. Oh, you do, do don't you? Know, you? I, the, the, I went out, it was like the first clear night we had, and I, I sort of wondered out. I wasn't doing any astronomy that night, um, and I wandered out, and I sort of looked out, and it was through a tree. I was like, I don't think the ISS is coming over this evening. I was sort of like, oh, no, it's Venus. And it just <laughs> takes me by surprise every flipping time. Yeah. Every flipping yeah. time. Yeah. But God, I, I went out. Um, I, I was with um, Neil, uh, Neil Hawkins, and, and Jane Tring Astronomy, mm. and we had a we had a gin night. We had oh, a man. night at a gin distillery with telescopes. Oh, is that the legendary campfire gin? The legendary campfire gin, and that is very good range of gin. Oh, it's a very good range of gin, and they did a whole distillery tour. I like gin. So that we had the distillers doing a distillery tour and and, and gin tasting. Very drunken gin tasting. Um, I like gin. And I did a, a whole series of talks on on spacey stuff and, and astronomy. And then outside with Neil and Jane and Mick, a uh, friend of theirs, we we had a bunch of telescopes and we showed people the sky. And it was great. We had a really great evening. It does sound like a good time, oh, actually. It was good. And then 
the following nights, it was just clear and clear and clear. And I, I just actually bagged myself some nights of astronomy that would not work. Fabulous. Man. Although, the best night I had, it, it kind of was so clear and I was hopping around even Lepus, which is really low sort of underneath the Rhine, hopping around galaxies. But it was that good. It was that good, and I was picking up all sorts of stuff there. It was brilliant. And then there was this moment about half 12 where I'm sort of, I am sort of sat back. You know when you sit back from your telescope and you kind of look at the sky and think, oh, yeah, look at the sky. That's nice. And I'm like, yeah. The stars are vanishing. Why are the stars vanishing? It's not clouding. <laughs> the stars are vanishing. It was getting foggy. <laughs> It was actually I was sitting oh, no. I was sitting in this fog bank and I hadn't even noticed and I was sitting thinking, God, where are the stars gone? It's gone really, really dim. And actually it was just all the bright ones are visible, but I was sitting in fog and then it was freezing fog and it was actually the millimetres of ice all over my telescope and everything. And I hadn't even oh. sort of noticed. It wow. got really, really cold and damp and suddenly it was like, Oh god, I'm covered in ice and my arms were covered mm. in ice. It was really, really cold. Good so you've wow. been taking a look at Beetlejuice over the past few nights oh, yeah. as well then. Because I think, looking at the AAVSO light curve, it looks like it's just starting to get a bit mm. brighter again. What have you guys thought? Yeah, there is a there is a Twitter account um, that is doing a daily update on the average brightness of, um, of Beetlejuice. Mm. It's, it's just using sort of people's best estimates. It's called... Um, at Beetlebot, so it's like B-E-T-E-L-B-O-T. Uh, it's called Beetlejuice Status, and they would agree with you mm. that it is. It looks like it might be starting to brighten. I my 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 thought when 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 we had that clear window was it hadn't got any dimmer. I I, I couldn't see if it got any yeah. brighter, but I didn't think it got any dimmer from when I'd seen it a couple of weeks before. It, yeah. so I, was, I was waiting for the clouds to come. I thought, oh, is it going to look even dimmer now? And I didn't think it had. I thought it it kind of is at least stabilised. But yeah, the light curve seems to suggest it is slowly getting brighter. Yeah, so looking looking at their latest plot, it's occurring. AAVSO suggests otherwise. That's showing that it's still decreasing. Is it really? Mm. Wow. Oh. Yeah. Well, this, yeah, I mean, this beetle bot is saying that it's sort of hovering between. 1.4 and 1.5 mag mm-hmm. so like it's kind of a little bit up and down up and down but yeah i i feel like it's plateauing wouldn't wouldn't you just Maybe. wouldn't you just murder to to be able to actually be close to it and see what's going on oh yeah. i know to actually yeah. see this star in it in its kind of death throes which it is i mean it's it it takes it's thousands just a of years. long, a long death row. It's yeah. a long death, row, but going through these various stages of, of of something we've never seen before, yeah, and going through that process of of dying and and getting towards collapsing, be fascinating to watch, wouldn't it? Yeah. Well, this is a thing because we just don't know what's going on with it. We don't know no. if this dimming is, you know, a precursor mm. to it exploding, or if, and I'm going to say it, if it's just a bit of dust. No, oh, I knew you were going to say that. It usually is. <laughs> It, I, I can almost guarantee you that it is a bit of dust that because I mean, it's been blowing off material right for, for thousands and thousands of years. It's just a bit of dust. You're gonna like one of my news stories later on. Ooh. Interesting. Yeah. Ooh. Ooh. Yeah. Ooh. Yeah. The other thing I just want to quickly mention before we move on to emails is that there is a wonderful Twitter account called at is Beetlejuice okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, and someone's created a parody account pretending to be Beetlejuice and they just tweet random shit and it just makes me happy. So uh, they said, for example, I install one dimmer switch in my dining room and the entire galaxy loses its shit. <laughs> and, um, there, there, was, there was one, I saw, I saw that account and they tweeted a, ah, made you look. <laughs> yeah, I yeah, saw exactly. that, that was good. <laughs> that, that one made me laugh. <laughs> oh, and uh, just one more thing before we do move on. Um, NASA Ames, um, the NASA facility, which is in, oh God, is it California or Ohio? Yeah, California. California. Um, they're doing a social event on February the 10th. So if you're anywhere in the area, you get to go and look behind the scenes. You do tours of labs, um, meeting researchers, working on future human and robotic missions to the moon. So if you're in the area, why not go and take a look February the 10th? Cool. So emails, I guess. Okay, so uh, just one email I think I'm going to um, talk about 
this month purely because um, of time, because I know we've got a lot to pack into this show. So from our good friend uh, West Obering, West says, Dear Paul, Ralph and Jenny, do you prefer Jen or Jenny? He asks, and we don't know either. Which do you prefer? Jen. Do you? I don't know. Everyone calls me Jen. Yeah. We, we just call you Oi. Very few. Yeah. yeah. Or Ted or Smith. Yeah. It's normally what I Oi, yeah. Oi, yeah. But, um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. Yeah, I feel like people call me Jen. Um, yeah. Not many people call me Jenny. Huh. Or if they do, it's because they're taking the piss and they're saying it like from Forrest Gump. I love you, Jenny. That's what I get. <laughs> And you refer to yourself as Jenny quite a bit too. Do I? Mm-hmm. I thought I was referred to myself as the Queen, but I'm, <laughs> I'm looking at the script here, which is entitled Episode Ninety Two, Jenny. Jenny, in fact, is I, I actually pause right. It's Jenny, Jenny, like that. I don't know. Yeah, maybe I write my name. I guess as Jenny. Like I sign off on emails as Jenny, but I feel like in conversation it's always Jen. Uh huh. Now my name is just starting to sound weird. So can we move on to if the email? If you've got a middle name, which is less controversial. Mm, Brilliant. No, I do have a middle name. Or what is it? What's your middle name? We don't know your middle oh, name. Shit. No, I'm not broadcasting that shit. <laughs> what a bizarre middle name. Mm, I'm not broadcasting that shit, <laughs> Millard. Anyway, mm. that was... <laughs> That's gone on far longer than it needed to, and that was mm. just a, a throwaway <laughs> question in the, in the email. Um... West says a couple of things. First, sorry I'm late to this party, but I have a suggestion for a name for the pair instability supernova. Ooh, How yeah. about Blastar? Mainly because it blasts like itself out of existence. Also, yeah, that's a good one. This name happens to be the name of a PC game Elon Musk wrote when he was 12 years old, living in South Africa, and sold for five hundred dollars to PC and Office Technology magazine. It seems appropriate. Oh, I know. Hmm. <laughs> <laughs> What a random fact that is. That's it seems appropriate to name the supernova a blastar since it gets blasted out of existence just as he is blasting our pristine night skies out of existence. What do you think? Oh, I well, like that. Yes, oh, we'll come to that later on. I like that. <laughs> we are going to come back to Starlink later. Yes, we are. Second, how about this explanation for helping Paul accept the new decade? Calling this the year 2020 is a little bit misleading because on midnight on last New Year's Eve, we actually celebrated completing our 2020th year no. while also beginning our 2021st. No. You see this every time you write down the date, it's always the current month, day, year. But that year is the current number we have completed since AD 0. No, because the there's day- no way. No, carry on, but I'm going to say no. <laughs> the day and month just represent the time that has passed completing the next one. So really, we're just counting up to completing our 221st year. Clear as mud? Nope, 2000. It's a new decade, so just go with no, it. No, because there is... No, 2021st, no, Ralph. There is no AD0. It doesn't exist. The, 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 it went from 1 BC or 1, 1 BC... BCE. BCE, I prefer BCE, um, mm-hmm. to 1 AD or 1 CE. Mm. It, we never had a zero. There is no year zero. So when you measure on your ruler, yes, you're right. When you get to one centimetre, you've completed the first centimetre. You went from zero to one. But, of course, there was no year zero. So year one fills in for that. So when you complete year one, when you, when you, when you, when we move to two, that was the completion of year one. So that means 2020, January, uh, December 31st, 2019, was the completion of the 19th year, or 2019th year. Um, so, sorry, wrong. <laughs> I love you, I love you, I love you, you're a brilliant listener, and you're awesome, and you've got a fantastic name, by the way. Yeah, but really cool name. you're wrong. <laughs> Ralph, you said 221st year, not 2021st. He was wrong anyway, it doesn't matter. And so, on to the news. And well, to be honest, I think Ralph's just here to wind me up with his first news story because uh, it's all about my favourite satellite system of all. Yes. Um, so, 
We've got some amateurs that are loving the novelty of this new light in the sky. Uh, others are concerned that this will pretty much consign um, Earth-based observation, astrophotography and professional data gathering to the, the dustbin. Um, it's Starlink, of course, uh, which we can already see in the night sky. Some people are saying that it looks like guitar strings going across the sky. Um, but it is something that at present is rather difficult uh, to see. You have to um, you have to know the timing's right when it's going overhead. Of course, this will all change in the future when there are 40,000 of them or however many are planned, which should be just a constant grid across the sky. And of course, there are plans uh, in place to uh, lower the albedo by making sure that they're less reflective, um, the, the rest of the satellites that go up. But also, they're, they're not in their um, operational altitude yet, um, and their um, solar panels aren't tilted towards the sun um, as they would be at that altitude. So we, we haven't got a handle yet on just how bright Starlink is going to be, but if it's anything like it is now, with the amount of satellites going up there, we can kiss goodbye to astrophotography, and it's going to be a hell of a mess for ground-based Earth observations. Um, and th- oh, yeah, a- so many observatories are getting affected by it already. They are. I mean, I now- know that they're not at cruising altitude and stuff, but even even so, they I can't see them getting all that much fainter. You know, could, the amount of faint light that some of these telescopes pick up. You know, they really, really dig down into it and Starlink is going to be in that zone. Anyway, Mm. I'm not going to talk because it's your news story and I'm just going to get angry. Well, we also have a very different opinion on this because I don't like getting angry about things until I know what the end state is going to be. But that said, and you're right about there being a lot of anger from the observatories, but again, it's that kind of diluted anger where it's, it's on the Twitter feeds rather than as official statements from them because we've got people like the All Sky Automated Survey for Supernova, Paul's favourite acronym, Assassin, um, and <laughs> they've been getting very aerated on on Twitter about the streaks and showing the photos that they've got um, that are yeah. uh, showing the the, the 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 light in the data. But it's not, although it's it's on the twitter feed you never know who it is that's using that twitter feed and is this like an official statement from them but likewise we've got the cerro tololo inter-american observatory in chile which has also got issues with these um affecting their dark energy survey camera And, and in many cases it is these survey images when you're looking at wide swaths of the sky that are naturally going to be affected um all the more but again that's on the twitter feed and we know that in in the future we're going to have one web Amazon, probably Chinese telecom providers also um, building these mega constellations. And if there's anything like the numbers um, that they're purporting to be in the um, in the hundreds or even in the thousands, that this is this is something that it's a tide that we can't roll back. It will happen. It's an inevitability. But also we want to make sure um, as some of the plans are with people like the International Astronomical Union, the Royal Astronomical Society, and these companies themselves, that they really need to come up with a plan to try and limit the amount of effect that it's going to have, to, because it is creating this scourge on the, the natural resource of the night skies for people. But of course, they don't really care much about that, because they see it as technological progress, and what does it matter if it yeah. upsets uh, a few scientists and a few amateur astronomers? Well, it matters a lot, we say. Yeah. So I wanted to get the inside track on this, so I contacted Keck and Coltec and... Um, Did you actually? Oh, yeah, and um, and also the Square Kilometre Array and ESA, and I want to, because I wanted to find out what the actual take is on this. Yeah. Uh, interesting that the, the Keck didn't even bother to reply, so they clearly aren't wanting to shout about their anger because uh, we would, of course, mm. amplified that for them on this platform. Um, The Director General of the Square Kilometre Array, Professor Philip Diamond, says that they're engaging directly with companies such as SpaceX to explore mitigation options and initiatives that could be applied to ensure that the large-scale investments in the SKA and other radio telescopes, their discovery potential and the likely spin-outs coming out of their development are safeguarded, while these new developments in telecommunications with their obvious broader societal benefits flourish. Recent statements from SpaceX officials are reassuring in this respect and we remain optimistic that the development of such satellite constellations can be compatible with radio astronomy, preserving our ability as a society to continue advancing our knowledge about our universe. So they're cautiously Ooh, optimistic. That's interesting. And that's, that's I mean, given that that's a radio telescope, you would imagine that they are 
they're going to be the ones that are going to be affected the most because it's a hugely they sensitive are, yeah. instrument. Um, yeah. And ESO, um, in their official statement, say that in coordination with the International Astronomical Union, the American Astronomical Society and the Royal Astronomical Society, ESO and other observatories are evaluating the effect that these satellite constellations will have on ground-based infrared and optical telescopes. Uh, the calculations will soon be made public after undergoing independent peer review. And I think that's probably what tracks with my feelings the most, that shouting about it on social media when we aren't yet equipped with all the facts is, is, is essentially counterproductive. And it's bloody annoying. No, that is fair. Because um, at present, it looks like astrophotography in particular is going to be screwed, but we just don't know at all until we see the results of Elon Musk's albedo reduction attempts um, and what it what things are like when they get into their operational altitude. As he says, we'll get a better sense of the value of this when satellites have raised orbits and arrays are tracking to the sun. Um, because it's just so easy to, to go off your head on Twitter and, and other social media platforms but until we've got the data, all we're doing is just adding to this huge orb of fear about everything that's out there. And everybody's just shouting into the void about everything. Yeah, and, and it just doesn't no help. No one's really listening, are they? Well, it, it, for me, it's the fact... It's just people getting angry. It's the lack of facts. And it's, you know, until we know it what is, the situation I do is. Appreciate, yeah, I do appreciate that people are starting to sort of, instead of just going like, I ate Starlink, it's so bloody annoying, they are actually putting out photos and being like, you know, well, I tried to take this image and look at it. Yeah. It's got all these tracks yeah. through it. So I feel like people are starting to gather the evidence. But yeah. Yeah. I feel like it really does have to be done in a proper scientific manner. And I think it's very interesting that um, the ESO observatories and other observatories are actually beginning to take this more seriously and are actually taking a scientific yeah. approach to it so i will be really interested to see these which i presume they're going to be papers because it's undergoing peer review yeah, so i'm assuming that yeah. these papers are going to be coming out yeah um it'll be really interesting to see what they've got to say and um the thing is uh, i feel like unfortunately it's going to be one of these cases where it's going to be we're only going to really know the true damage when it's kind of already too late like these satellites are all going to be up there and then reducing their albedo is not as straightforward as everyone thinks because you know a lot of people are like well why can't you just paint them black why can't you use you know the the vanta black or or whatever mm. and it's like well the problem is black absorbs a hell of a lot of light especially these you know these blackest blacks you know they, they're absorbing all this energy and then that just causes your satellites to overheat yeah then they don't work and it's or they might blow up and you can only change the colour of the bodies effectively you can't change the solar panels and as we know with Iridium satellites it's when the tilt of the uh, solar arrays is in the right angle that it reflects the sunlight down to you mm. whereas of course you can't put uh, an opaque coating on solar panels because you need them to be there to soak up the photons uh, so they have to yeah. remain in a light absorbing fashion yeah so it's it's um, it's an interesting problem that's developing yeah. So on to more happier things. Um, the next uh, story I want to cover is one that is combining astronomy tools um, to get a really good track on the origins of certain chemicals and, and tracing them through the evolution of, well, not just the cosmos, but also our solar system too. So this is uh, new research in the monthly notices of the Royal Astronomical Society from the Atacama Large Millimeter Submillimeter Array, or ALMA, and the Rosina instrument on board Rosetta, um, which took a look at churyumov gerasimenko the comet, a, a few years ago. When, when was it? It's, it's a few years ago now, isn't it? Launched in 2004. Got there. Got to the comet in 2014. Ah. You, you feel like it's really recent, but it's not. It's a historic mission now. Um, and this is this is looking into the origins and the proliferation of phosphorus monoxide. Um, now, phosphorus is important to us, um, particularly important, as it's one of the six key building blocks found in all living things, along with carbon, hydrogen, nitrogen, oxygen, and sulfur. So we're really interested to observe its origins in the universe and understand how it came to be abundant enough on Earth for life to flourish. Now, we know that almost everything heavier than hydrogen and helium is formed in the heart of stars or supernovas when large stars explode. 
And ALMA has now shown that gas flowing out from these stars create little holes in the interstellar dust like Swiss cheese that phosphorus precursors get trapped in. And this has led to a theory that if these cavities collapse to form a star, phosphorus monoxide can freeze and get trapped in the icy dust grains that remain around the new star. Those dust grains would then come together to form pebbles, rocks and ultimately comets, which can then carry this important molecule with it. And as we know with things like Borisov and Mwamwa, that um, these asteroids and comets quite often get flung out of their own star systems as well. Mm-hmm. And that's where the two-year study of Comet Churyumov-Gerasimenko by Rosetta's Rosina instrument comes in, because hints of phosphorus were detected on the comet, but it took a new analysis of uh, the data to confirm that it was the precursor phosphorus monoxide on the comet that carried it there, helping astronomers draw a connection between star-forming regions that ALMA was looking at, where the molecules created, all the way to Earth. Oh my god, I love it. It's the whole evolution of phosphorus monoxide as a phosphorus carrying molecule all the way from the birthing stars and star forming regions through to it floating around in the solar system. Isn't that amazing? And of course we still don't know whether uh, we still suspect that um, uh, that comets are one of the possible ways that the chemicals for life got carried to Earth. And Catherine Altweg, the Rosina principal investigator at the University of Bern, said, Phosphorus is essential for life as we know it. As comets most probably delivered large amounts of organic compounds to the Earth, the phosphorus monoxide found in comet 67P may strengthen the link between comets and life on Earth. That's brilliant. Isn't it? It really makes you think, doesn't it? Especially with, like, the interstellar comets, where, where, you know, maybe life started in one place in the galaxy and it's just been kind of spreading out from there. Yeah. Via, you know, random bits of rock ejected from the system and then happening to land on another bit of rock that's suitable for life. And, oh, I love stuff like this. Okay, first up for me is a new explanation for one of the brightest supernovae ever recorded. This is SN2006GY um, that appeared in Perseus 14 years ago and quickly earned its position in that rarest of categories, a hypernova. Nice. Um, So this was an event that despite being 240 million light years away in galaxy NGC 1260, it reached magnitude 14, which was the same apparent magnitude as that galaxy. Oh, what? Uh, so this will give you a, which is pretty impressive when you think mm. about it. Um, there was also a strange unexplained spectra recorded, but as this was a pretty new type of explosion, uh, you know, people, people, it's kind of, it was unexplained and uh, I, I think people assumed that that was perhaps the spectra of a, of a hypernova. Um, so it was believed to be a hypergiant star. Um, they sort of really beyond what you know everyone's getting excited about Beetlejuice so we're talking about something well beyond the size of that Uh, but quite why it was so bright has been a mystery and a matter of conjecture ever since well SN2006 GY fans wonder no more those cunning types at the Max Planck Institute um, in the journal Science this is um, have revealed that it was no hypergiant and the strange spectra held the answer this was in fact a type 1a supernova Um, So, of course, this is the kind where a white dwarf has material dumped on it by a companion star that then causes the white dwarf to flare up because, of course, the the temperatures, pressures and everything, uh, the amount of material, gravity and everything sort of builds up and then you get this um, sort of flare up of of stellar activity. And essentially it's burning off this new material in a sort of rapid, very bright and energetic manner. So that's, that's what we see with Type 1A. The difference here was the progenitor star was surrounded by a cloud and here we are. Jenny, you're going to like this, because, of course, it's all about the dust. See, it is always about dust. (laughs) Always. Um, It was surrounded by a cloud of iron dust. Now, this had an iron to a mass of about a third of our sun in a cloud um, around the star. So, in all likeliness, it was put there by the companion star. Well, the team led by Anders Jekstrand um, have demonstrated that this Type 1A erupted very early in the cycle, after just a century of accumulation, rather than the typical millions, sometimes billions of years, um, 
that it usually gets to build up to, to get these eruptions. And then what happened is this explosion ran into this cloud of iron dust surrounding it, and it was like hitting a wall, essentially as a, as a sort of analogy. And the energy was released from, from the, the, uh, the supernova was in the order of 10 to the 44 joules. Yeah, so that's a one with 44 zeros after it, joules. Um, and much of the kinetic energy um, in the impact with this iron cloud was then released as light, giving us this incredibly bright hypernova. So not a hypergiant, but actually one of the smaller objects in the sky combined with a lot of iron, dust, and a whole lot of energy. So really great story and really great piece of investigative uh, ah. sort of astronomy there using data that is now sort of 14 years old and they, they've built this picture of what actually happened yeah i like that okay so as one mystery closes another has appeared to open with the news that ligo has another detection but an odd and so far untraced one on january the 14th this year the three detectors that's the two ligo observatories in the us and the virgo detector in italy picked up a 14 millisecond burst of gravitational waves as they pass through the earth but so far nothing has been located in the sky that could reveal what this was typically the detection of merging neutron stars has lasted around 30 seconds so as a series of sort of waves that are produced um, so it's not so it's just one um, so this signal appears to be something different Merging black holes? Maybe a supernova? Well, excitement mounted for a moment as the detection seemed to come from a region of the sky around Orion. <laughs> Linked to another story. Um, was this the first death throw of the ever-dimming Betelgeuse? Well, no neutrinos followed, and unless it's popped after we've recorded this, then Betelgeuse was still there last time I looked. So one highly speculative, but I thought brilliant solution, was that this was a supernova of a star as it fell into a black hole. Oh, what? <laughs> so, yeah, so no neutrinos released. So they all got sucked in just, just as it happened. Whoop, and it went. Um, anyway, the view from the LIGO world is that this was too short for what they would expect from a large star collapse. It's certainly too short for a neutron star merger based on their experience since 2017. So it might be the merger of two intermediate-sized black holes. But at present, nobody knows, and the investigation continues. As ever, gravitational astronomy is throwing up all these nice new surprises, and it's a whole new frontier for us to explore. Brilliant stuff. Love it. Oh, that's a good news story. Now it's time for the biggie. The big news story. The one that's at the top of everyone's list. It's the decommissioning of Spitzer. Ah... Uh... I know. We knew it was coming. We did mention it last year, but it doesn't make it any less sad. Um, mm. This month, we say goodbye mm. to, quite frankly, a really old workhorse of the astronomy world. Wow, Spitzer, where do you even begin with such a telescope? I mean, I feel like it's a telescope that is just so underrepresented in like popular culture. Because it's always mm. about Hubble. People are always, oh, I love Hubble, Hubble images. But Spitzer, my God, mm. the discoveries that have been made using this telescope. 16-year mission in total. 11 years beyond its planned life. But it's just some phenomenal stuff. But I thought we'd go through a little bit of a history of it and talk about its mm -hmm. best discoveries. So yeah. it was named after uh, the late but very great Dr. Lyman Spitzer Jr., who actually developed the concept of space-based telescopes in 1946. So way before the launch of like Sputnik or anything. But Spitzer has done, oh my God, what hasn't it done? It did the first studies of exoplanet atmospheres. Hmm. It discovered five of the seven Earth-sized exoplanets around TRAPPIST-1 and then confirms that the other two existed. Mm -hmm. It's looked at stars at every stage of their lives. It's looked at the most distant galaxies, nebulae, it's mapped the Milky Way in unprecedented detail. Of course, we've used it to study dust. We've done spectroscopy with it to work out the composition of dust. We studied comets. It's done follow-up studies of test planets. So, you know, like really even up-to-date stuff. It found a massive large ring around Saturn that was made up of really diffuse dust that's really hard to see in the visible. You need to look in the infrared for it. And it's got a 27 degree tilt sort of compared to the main ring um, and extends over 7 million miles out away from the planet. So 
yeah absolutely massive but um i think that covers pretty much all aspects of astronomy mm. it's so cool it is like it's just an amazing telescope um but i guess pro- people are probably thinking like well hang on if it's still doing science with like tests exoplanets and stuff why why is it being decommissioned the problem is they get into the stage where they're just they can't get the data back um mm. at the minute they can only send back data for two and a half hours a day that's it so yeah it's it's basically because the telescope has drifted too far away from home and we can't communicate with it which is really sad because it's still working very well despite only having one instrument going um but on the upside it does free up money for other instruments and other missions cool and of course, we've got JWST, um, hopefully. Juiced. <laughs> Juiced. Which is, yeah, Spitzer's replacement is JWST. So. Which is why, as well, Spitzer got this extension, was because JWST was delayed. And so it got funding extended. But now it, it is really like they can't get any more out of it. So, yeah, that's Spitzer. Bye bye, Spitzer. Decommissioned on the 30th of January. So, as this goes out, happened yesterday. It is time for our newly formatted Sky Guide. So in the new version, we focus on a constellation each month and we learn how to find it on the sky, do a little bit of a tour of it, pointing out some interesting objects. So really, I think Paul is trying to lull me into a false sense of security this month because, once again, we're covering a constellation that I can actually pronounce the name of. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I mean, I'm saying that now. There are definitely some things coming up that are going to make some wonderful outtakes because I'm definitely <laughs> going to get them wrong. I always do. But, you know, we need material for December, so it's fine. Anyway, Lynx is a Northern Hemisphere constellation. Um, and to be honest, a little bit like our focus last month, it's not an obvious one. Um, and it's, it's not easy to find. And it's another one of those constellations that was created to fill in a gap in the sky between two other larger, like, more well-known constellations. And the ones this time are Auriga and Ursa Major. Uh, the constellation of Lynx is also bounded by some other pretty famous ones. So we've got Gemini, Cancer, Leo. There's several others as well. And it was actually introduced in the 17th century by Polish astronomer Johannes Hevelius, who's actually responsible for a couple of other constellations in the night sky, like Canis Venetici and Sextons. Interesting little factoid for you there. So, where does the name Lynx come from? Is it because the constellation looks like a big old kitty cat on the sky? No, of course it isn't, because this is astronomy. (laughs) Nothing is ever straightforward. No. It's because the stars in the constellation are reasonably faint and Hevelius reckoned you needed the eyes of a lynx to be able to see them. Oh, I like that. Yeah. Now, there is some line of thought that perhaps Hevelius did have an ancient myth in mind when he was creating this constellation. Now, there was someone called Lynceus who sailed with Jason and the Argonauts and it was said that he had the keenest eyesight of all men and could even see things underground. So, maybe there's some sort of very loose, tenuous connection to that myth. But to be honest, it is a bit of a stretch. (laughs) Now, the stars in the constellation are faint. There's only one which is brighter than fourth magnitude. Also doesn't help. It doesn't have any Messier objects in it. But that doesn't mean that there aren't plenty of interesting things in this patch of sky. So, to find lengths... We're going to start off with one of the most well-known constellations in the night sky. That is Ursa Major, the Great Bear. Now, if you're unfamiliar with this constellation in its entirety, you'll almost certainly be familiar with the asterism of the plough or the Big Dipper. So we're going to start at Fecta in the plough, and then we want to travel down the legs of the bear, following the leg that's kind of kicking forward slightly through Psi Ursae Majoris until we end at the paw, and that's marked by two stars. You've got yellowish Tanya Australis and then whitish Tanya Borealis. Those two stars, okay? So the poor of Ursa Major is actually pointing directly in the direction that we want to go to get to Lynx. So what you're going to do is you're going to extend the line between Psi Ursae Majoris and Tanya Australis, that same distance again. And then just at the end of that line, you'll come across the magnitude 3 yellowish star Alpha Linsis which is actually the brightest star in the constellation. Um, 
The rest of the stars of Lynx are fainter and they're between like magnitude three and a half, four and a half, something like that. Yeah, so it's it's Paul's definitely picked a tricky mm. one this this time. It's it's but imagine if you do work out how to find it on the sky, you'll be one of a few people who know how to find this constellation. So <laughs> I feel like it's something point. worth doing. You can show off. Like yeah. You go to a star party, you're like, see, I know where Lynx is. And then everyone's like, ooh. And then you're like some kind of superstar for about an hour. Yeah. Anyway, so we're at the brightest star and um, this constellation, it kind of zigzags across the sky in a line pointing towards the constellation of Camelopardalis. Um, away from the head of Leo as well. So if you can kind of picture where Leo is and this is where Lynx is. The stars in the constellation follow a colour pattern of yellow, white, yellow, white, yellow, white all the way along. Um, And I think that's really going to help you guys in finding the eight stars that trace out this constellation. It is a long, old, thin constellation. Um, The whole length of the constellation is actually longer than the handle and the bowl of the plough. So do bear that in mind when you're trying to trace these stars across the sky. And the couple of objects that I've picked out for you are both visible in small to medium-sized telescopes, but probably beyond the reach of binoculars unless you have a steady tripod and excellent vision. And the first one is NGC 2419, also included in Patrick Moore's catalogue as Coldwell 25. NGC 2419 also carries the names of the intergalactic tramp or the intergalactic wanderer due to suspicions that it was a star outside the Milky Way long after it was discovered by William Herschel in 1788. In 1922, the American astronomer Carl Lamplin discovered that it was really a globular cluster using the Lowell Observatory in Flagstaff, Arizona. At magnitude 9.06, you'll see a glob that's highly concentrated at the centre through any size telescope on a dark night, and this month's a great time to take a look in the Northern Hemisphere. As Jenny said, Lynx isn't a bright and obvious constellation, and NGC 2419 is just as close to Gemini as it is to its home constellation. So here's a nice cheat for you. Given that the stars are quite faint in Lynx, find Dubé at the end of the bowl of the plough, or the Big Dipper, and everyone's favourite star at the moment, Betelgeuse in Orion. (laughs) If you can find it. Hey! (laughs) (laughs) Or that... uh, that star that's brighter than the moon (laughs) (laughs) if it's gone supernova Um, (laughs) now they're really far apart but this is a much easier way to find it NGC 2419 is at exactly the halfway point between those two stars so start with a low magnification and crank it up to wherever looks like the sweet spot in your scope to see one of the most remote globular clusters from both the sun and the galactic centre making it almost twice as distant as the Large Magellanic Cloud. Oh, wow, that's really cool. Not here just for tips, but for facts too. Mm. Uh, Next up, we have magnitude 10.6 galaxy, NGC 2683, also discovered in 1788 by William Herschel, the same year as our previous pick. What a busy little (laughs) bastard. Because this galaxy appears nearly edge-on from our perspective, it was originally thought to be an unbarred spiral, but infrared studies in 2009 now show evidence for the presence of a bar in NGC 2683, which is also known as the UFO galaxy. Now, although you won't be able to determine this for yourself, a medium-sized scope will show you a thin streak of light nine arc minutes across. Larger scopes will show the central bulge and maybe even traces of the dust lanes. Certainly a 10-inch or larger scope will soak all of this detail up for you. Another awesome astronomy star hopping avoidance cheat. Find Merak, the other pointer star in the bowl of the plough or Big Dipper, and another winter bright triangle star, Procyon, in Canis Major. NGC 2683 is at exactly the halfway point between these two stars. Huh, like that. Globular clusters and galaxies being more clearly defined than nebulae will stand out against the dark background of the sky in CCD, CMOS or DSLR camera images. Even in a few five-minute guided exposures, you'll have a nice image when combined in stacking software. A few ten-minute exposures will begin to look very impressive. No need for any filters, as narrowband won't work as well on galaxies or star clusters as they do with nebulae, though adding a hydrogen alpha channel can add contrast if you find it worth the bother. So I guess that's our deep sky. We've got our constellation. 
which is not easy to find so do let us know if you do manage to spot it and, and find all the stars and everything because we will be quite impressed it's mm. a bit of a challenge this yeah. month yeah let us know um but we got our objects so it's probably time to come a little bit closer to home and do our solar system roundup okay so some interesting things going on this month um, a few nice conjunctions and and whatnot so the ninth brings us dare I say it, a super moon. So the full moon is going to look particularly big and bright. Um, I say big, you'll struggle to see the difference, but there is a certain amount. It's about 14% difference in brightness, so it will, if it's a nice clear night, it will feel particularly bright for a full moon. Um, and if you're doing some imaging, you might be able to notice that there is a, a significant difference in size, but you can really only see this in imaging if you've, you've imaged uh, the moon at its furthest distance at full and this this sort of super moon is closest bit uh, it's a term that i think we're, we're starting to get used to now isn't it super moon it's fun it gets people looking up uh the nights or well rather the mornings uh as as it has been to sort of after midnight of the 17th and 18th gives a unique opportunity to use mars to spy on a couple of nebulae um on these nights mars is nestled between the lagoon and the triffid nebulae uh triffid above lagoon below uh, with about half a degree or so between the nebulae and the red planet, which would be a fantastic view. Um, these are two great nebulae that actually in the northern hemisphere, especially as far north as, as the UK, are quite often overlooked because they've, they're quite low in the sky. Um, and, and they are beautiful. You can see them. They are actually sort of almost M42 style brightness, so you can pick them up in binoculars. You can see that, that area of bright cloudiness um, well worth having a look and with Mars there sitting between them this is a great sort of wild uh, sort of wide field view that, that you should kind of if you get the chance after midnight go and have a look and then at the end of the month 26 28th the thin crescent moon will be very close to Venus in the evening sky so that's a good chance to have a look at them together Venus is always very beautiful um, and that crescent moon I mean who cannot help but fall in love with the crescent moon it is such a stunningly beautiful thing in the evening especially when you're getting that sort of move through twilight into the into darkness and you've got that twilight bit of earth shine then you've got venus just it just yeah it's a it's a beautiful romantically astronomy view that you you, you should uh, take advantage of if you can um though of course the weather eh, it's that time of year okay so what do we have in terms of meteor showers then ralph well, no meteor showers for the Northern Hemisphere this month, but although low in frequency, the Alpha Centaurids does provide some bright meteors for our Southern Hemisphere listeners, and I think this is the first Southern Hemisphere meteor shower we've covered, so you should count yourself lucky, mm. Southern Hemisphereites. I know, special treat. Yeah. Actually, something that you guys can do. Yeah. Um, so, mm. peaking on the 8th of February, super fast moving debris from an unknown solar system object only gives us around 6 meteors per hour under ideal conditions. But as these motes of dust are travelling at 58 kilometres a second, they do light up nicely and can leave smoke trails in their wake. The radiant nice. will be in the southeast in the constellation Centaurus. You have the southern cross of the constellation Crux and the third brightest star in the sky, Rigel Centaurus, as your guides. Lying back on a sun lounger or sitting in a chair facing anywhere in that direction will give you your best naked eye views. Patience will be the key. And of course, it's I guess it's still pretty warm, right? Because they're just getting to the end of summer. I'm expecting so. Yeah. All right then, Southern Hemisphere listeners, tell us what it's like in February where you are. Is it is it still pretty warm? If you're facing Centaurus. <laughs> yeah, specifically that. <laughs> and so, Paul, tell us what the moon phases are. Uh, we have first quarter on the 2nd, full on the 9th, last on the 15th, and new on the 23rd. So, clear skies and happy hunting. And so, we're on to that time of the show where we do something a little bit different, a little bit special. Past few months we've been having a debate, now we're exploring the electromagnetic spectrum. So, what I like about this new section is I feel like we're going back to our roots a little bit. Kind of back to the days where we did to do a little bit of astrophysics and astronomy show, you know, gasp horror, how very dare we. And 
This new section is all about the electromagnetic spectrum. And in this show, so the astronomy show, um, we're going to talk about like the wavelengths of light, the phenomena that we can study at these wavelengths and why making use of the whole electromagnetic spectrum and not just the tiny part of it that our eyes can see is so important to widening our eyes on the universe. So this episode, we're going to talk about what the electromagnetic spectrum actually is. Because I mean, I think that's a fair enough starting point because it is a phrase that's kind of bandied about a lot. But what do we actually mean when we say electromagnetic spectrum? So it describes all of the wavelengths of light that exist. So it includes the light that we can see with our eyes and the light that we can't. And there is far more light that we can't see with our eyes than what we can see. In fact, most of the universe is invisible to our eyes. Radio waves, microwaves, the infrared, ultraviolet, x-rays, gamma rays, all of this we simply cannot see. So it's a good job, really, that we can build instruments that can see this light. Otherwise, we'd miss out on so much of the universe. But the question is, what is light? What is this radiation? Light is basically travelling energy. And it's made up of interacting electric and magnetic waves, hence the name, electromagnetic. All light travels at the same speed. So no matter if it's visible light or radio waves, um, they're all travelling at the same speed. There are some exceptions. So sometimes when light is travelling through something, it can slow down. But we're not going to go down that road just yet. For our purposes, light all travels at the same speed, no matter what sort of light we're looking at. Now, these waves... They oscillate, much like waves moving through water, and the frequency of the oscillation dictates what sort of light we're dealing with. So if the light is high frequency, i.e. there's lots and lots of oscillations in a given time period, that means that the wave is high energy. So it's going to be sitting in the gamma ray or the x-ray part of the electromagnetic spectrum. If the wave is a low frequency one, so there's not many oscillations in a given time period, that means the wave is low energy. So it might sit in the radio part of the spectrum, for example. The wavelength of light is then the distance between two oscillations. So if you're oscillating faster, you've got a shorter wavelength and vice versa. But what this all boils down to, what it means is that all light is fundamentally the same. It's just that the energy of the light differs, giving it different properties. Now, why might light have different energies, though? Well, it all depends on the process that produced the light. Energetic events will produce higher energy forms of light, giving us things like gamma rays or X-ray emission. And less energetic events will give us longer wavelength light, like radio emission. Now, all this talk of light as waves is great, but... There's a bit of an elephant in the room, because what about photons? We haven't talked about them yet. So where do they fit into all of this? So to understand that, we do have to skirt the outer edges of quantum mechanics, but only the very, very edge of it, I promise. In the 1900s, a physicist called Max Planck was investigating black bodies. Basically, he was heating things up and measuring the light they gave off and comparing that to the light that he used to heat them up. Now, he found that he couldn't explain his measurements using classical physics. Now, according to classical physics, matter could absorb and emit any amount of energy. Really didn't matter. But Planck found that the amount of energy absorbed or emitted by the things he was heating up had to be whole number multiples of a base unit of energy. And this was absolutely scandalous. But What Planck had found is that energy, in terms of light, is not continuous, like string, but it's quantized, like beads or money, because, you know, you can't have one-tenth of a penny. What it meant was that light energy must move about in these little packets, and this is where the idea of photons come from. A photon is a packet of light. It's a discrete amount of energy. So in summary, the electromagnetic spectrum describes all the light radiation that exists in the universe. Light is travelling energy, and it's made of oscillating electric and magnetic waves, 
but the amount of energy light can have is discrete and it has to be a whole number of packets. Light behaves like waves and like particles. And there we are, your introduction to the electromagnetic spectrum. Uh, so what what do we think we what we're going to kick off with? Are we going to go from one end of the spectrum to the other? We're going to start with gamma or radio waves next week. I month. thought we start with radio waves, mm-hmm. because, and then we're going to move through the spectrum. Yeah. And I thought we start with radio waves because I feel like it's something that people are going to be more familiar with, right? Because yeah. everyone's got a radio in their car. Um, yeah. Some people, people might know have what even radar had. Is. A, yeah. Some people might have even had a go at building a radio telescope themselves before. So I figured we'd start one end where we're probably a little bit more familiar with yeah. what we're talking about and then we'll good get idea. up to the complicated things afterwards once we've got a nice good grounding yeah. in uh, different areas of the spectrum. Great. Thank so yeah, you. next month it'll be radio. On that note, it's time to end. God, we covered a lot of this stuff this month. So I'm not going to drone on. I'm done. You're done. We're done. Ta-ra. Toodle pip and all that. I'm not going to beg. Frankly, only do that sort of degrading behaviour in exchange for questionable sex acts. <laughs> but give us a review. Get involved. Email us. Talk on Twitter or post on Facebook if you can see past the mountains of tittery. Uh, last month, we recorded at the Cradle of Aviation Museum in Long Island, so do check out our podcast extra from there, and go visit the museum if you're in New York. It really is a fantastic place to visit. I absolutely thoroughly enjoy my time there. And if you're on the other side of the pond, Astro Camp 15 is now taking bookings, and at £45 for three nights of observing in an international dark sky site with your favourite Martians and a Welshie, Kiwi. we're practically giving it away. <laughs> oh, and did I mention that we always give away a telescope too? Actually, so, we do always give away a telescope. This is true. We do. So head over to astrocamp.awesomeastronomy.com to join us at the back end of April. So until our space exploration show in the middle of the month, it's goodbye from Cydonia Base. Awesome Astronomy is produced at Orbital Sound Limited by Ralph, Paul, Jenny, John and Damien and is free to use and distribute with attribution. We promote general science, astronomy, space science and rational thinking with more resources on our website at awesomeastronomy.com. If you want us to read your comments out on the show, send us your views, opinions, questions or critiques to the show at awesomeastronomy.com. Tweet us at awesomeastropod or give the Awesome Astronomy Facebook page a like and leave your comments there. Thanks for listening, and from Sidonia Base, end of transmission.